open your Bibles, please, to the book of Philippians, chapter 3, the third chapter of Philippians in your Schofield Bible, page 1260-1260. We'll be reading responsibly verses 10 through 14. The text verses are the 12th, 13th, and 14th verses. We'll read one other verse in the fourth chapter. I'll direct you. Let's stand, please, for the reading of the Word of God. that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Jesus Christ. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, let's continue, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let's read also together verse 11 of chapter 4. Verse 11, let's read it together. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the marvelous day thus far. There's just no church like this church. We're thankful for it. We're thankful for what's been accomplished. And we're, of course, here we are at the evening service. Obviously, there's more work to be done. And we pray that you'd bless in this time. Help us as we meet together. May our hearts and minds be as one as we focus upon thy word, a portion of it. We pray for our preacher. Bless him, bless us all. In Jesus' name, amen. It's amazing the progress that he's made since I took him on as a voice student. <clears throat> One of my prized pupils is... Uh, all I taught him was how to get loud. That's all I taught him. But, but he already had the talent and... Uh, I want to read for you, without your turning to it, just two of the passages read a while ago. Paul said, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And then it seems like a contrasting statement or a paradox. It says in just a few verses later, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I want to talk to you tonight, and I can't be contented with being discontented. I think that's what I want to speak on. I I can't, no, I can't be contented without being discontented. I know that's what I want to speak on. (laughs) You wouldn't know the difference anyway. But I want to talk tonight, and I cannot be contented without being discontented. Let me say it again. I cannot be contented without being discontented. Our Heavenly Father, bless the message tonight to our saved souls, to our serving you better, loving you more, doing more for you. Please help me to help the people tonight. Amen. There it is less than a chapter apart, a seeming contradiction and a paradox. In one message, the Apostle Paul has absolute contentment. Nothing nothing disturbs the calmness or the serenity of his soul. Yet in the other text, just a few verses apart, he insists that he is not for one moment satisfied. A seeming contradiction. Yet the Bible is in perfect harmony with itself. So there cannot be a conflict in the Bible. Now let's harmonize these two statements. In one statement, the Apostle Paul says he is contented, satisfied. In the other statement, and it's just just a chapter apart, Paul says he is discontented and not satisfied. Now what is he saying? Paul is saying, I'm content with what I have, but I'm not content with what I've done. It's exactly what he's saying. He's saying, I'm content. Now, yeah, I'm, co- I'm content with what I have. I'm content with my circumstances. I'm content with my environment. 
but I'm not content with what I've done. Paul is saying, I'm content with my surroundings, but not my tamers. That you and I, you and I are just the opposite. We get discontented with our environment, but not with our attainments. But the Apostle Paul says, I'm perfectly contented with where I live. I'm contented with what I wear. I'm contented with what I eat. I'm contented with what I have. But I'm not contented yet with what I have done. He's saying, I'm contented with my circumstances, but not with my accomplishments. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. May I share with you the circumstances with which he's contented? He's in the Mamertine prison. If you've ever been to Rome, you've seen that Mamertine prison, which is nothing more than a dungeon down underneath a, a dungeon. Paul is in the Mamertine prison. He's not a Holiday Inn. I've stayed in both, and I've been to both. And these days, Mamertine prison, at least they don't have any bars at the Mamertine prison. But uh, Paul was in the Mamertine prison. And Paul was the aged Paul down in that cold, damp Mamertine prison. He said, I've learned to be content here. I have no complaints about where I am. Now then he said, I'm not content with what I've done. Oh, my soul, look at what he had done. He had taken the gospel or started churches in Cyprus, in, in Pamphylia, in Perga, in Iconium, in Derbe, in Antioch, in Antioch and Pisidia, in Lystra, in Galatia, in Troas, in Philippi, in Berea, in Thessalonica, in Ephesus, in Corinth, in Colossae, in Crete, in Rome, had taken the gospel of the Western world and said he's not content with what he's done. The Apostle Paul, had, uh, he had, he had uh, written 14 books in the New Testament. And all of this in a period of less than 30 years. But he said, I'm contented with where I am, but I'm not contented with what I, uh, content with what I have done. He said he had stripes above measure. He had been prisoned frequently, five times beaten with 39 stripes three times beaten with rods, been stoned and shipwrecked and robbed, but he said, I am content with what I ha have. I am not content with what I have done. And uh, uh, Paul is saying, attaining is better than obtaining. Say it again. Attaining is better than obtaining. Possessing is better than possession. Progressing is better than progression. Fulfilling is better than fulfillment. The journey is better than the destination. Achieving is better than the achievement. Uh, traveling is better than arriving. The goal of effort is better than a goal that is stationary. Goals should be progressive goals, and there should be no end in our goal. People say, Brother House, what's your goal for First Baptist Church? It's the next step up. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table and a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. So the Apostle Paul is saying, attainment is but for a momentary satisfaction. Hear me carefully. If God gave me a choice tonight between suddenly possessing all truth, I don't, don't miss this now, possessing all truth, and gave me a choice between that and a constant search for truth, I would choose the latter. If God gave me a choice tonight between becoming the pastor, get this now, becoming the pastor of America's largest church and an opportunity to try to build America's largest church, I would choose the latter. If God gave me a choice between inheriting a million dollars and earning a thousand, I don't know what I'd do. I try to be as honest as I can. But I believe tonight if God gave me a choice between inheriting a million dollars and earning a thousand, I'd, I'd choose the latter. When 30 years ago I had a choice of being given the house we live in, in Munster, or paying it out over a period of 30 years, I chose the latter. The church voted, uh, tried, the deacons tried to give me the house we lived in 30 years ago, over 30 years ago. I refused that because I'd rather have it paid off over a period of 30 years than have it then. If, if I had been given the choice of moving at marriage into our present house or living as we have lived through these years, for example, we started off with a one-bedroom house. No kitchen, no meals, no place to cook, no refrigerator, no stove, no private bathroom, one little room. We didn't have a shower. We didn't have a sprinkle. We didn't have anything. 
We didn't have a spoon, didn't have a fork, and didn't have a plate, didn't have a saucer, didn't have a cup, didn't have a saucepan, didn't have a skillet, didn't have anything. And by the way, I'm glad we didn't. Now, you want to have showers? Okay. But by the way, don't, be invite, don't invite me to your shower and tell me what, what kind of dishes to buy you. Don't do that to me. Our, our silver is registered at Marshall Fields. It's lovingly yours. Well, it's going to be loving and yours because I ain't going to buy you none. I'll buy you what I want to buy you. And our China is, uh, is I don't care if it's your Japan or your, uh, England. I don't care. I don't, don't send it to me. Now you say, preacher, you get mad at me. I'm not getting mad at you. And don't you get mad at me because if you get mad at me, I'm the preacher and I can make it rough on you. <laughs> but I want to say this tonight. That little one-bedroom place we had, then we moved to one room, six by twelve. We shared a kitchen with eight other couples and shared a bathroom, uh, two bathrooms with eight other couples. Then after that, we moved into a real fancy apartment, had two rooms. Had a wood stove, kerosene kitchen stove, no sink, no refrigerator. Miss Howes washed our clothes in the bathtub, but it was no problem. We'd have any clothes to wash. I, and, and, and we lived in a little two-room place with a, with, a, with, a, with a wood stove in the bedroom and a kerosene kitchen stove. From that, we moved into a rat-infested apartment. From that, into two rooms at 2007 North Franklin uh, in Marshall, Texas, filled with cockroaches and bed bugs. From that, we went to a parsonage, our first little parsonage, the back bedroom was so weak that two people couldn't get in the back bedroom at the same time. We slept in the front bedroom, and if two folks walked across the back bedroom at the same time, the floor fell through. Or in some cases, if one person walked across in the bedroom. Where's Keith? He's not here. What Ray Young will do? Somebody tell that fellow I got saved, that boxer that got saved as far as going to fight the former heavyweight champion. Jack Scott called him a bomb. Would you tell him that for me, please? But anyway, uh, then, then we moved into a parsonage, uh, and then uh, we moved into a two-bedroom house that cost $5,000, and then into another house that cost $5,000, and then into another house that cost $5,900, and then to a frame house, three-bedroom, that cost $7,800, and then our present house. Now, if somebody told me back yonder 51 year and a half years ago, Ms. House and I got married, you can move in your present house or go to that little one-room place and, that, and share the bathroom with eight, two bathrooms, eight other couples, and share the kitchen, and then have a wood stove and then a kerosene stove and wash in the bathtub. If somebody said you can go all the way up from that little one-room house to someday having the house you have now or have the house you have now when you get married, I'd choose to work my way up. I love progress. I love progress. I don't understand you pastors that are satisfied with what you got right now. Boy, I love progress. I love people that are moving on. And, uh, and the Apostle Paul said, I'm in prison. I'm an old man. But he said, I'm not satisfied. I'm content with what I have, but I'm not content with what I've done. And by cracky, that's in the Greek, he said, by cracky. He said, by cracky, I am going. I have not yet apprehended. I count not myself to have apprehended. I'm forgetting those things I have done, and I'm reaching forward to new things and higher goals and greater achievement. I'm not satisfied. Boy, I'd like to get the preachers of America dissatisfied with what you're doing. Wouldn't hurt you to quit your golf game. Wouldn't hurt you to quit your fishing, hunting for a while, and get busy for God and do something for God. I'd be ashamed. Oh, I'd be ashamed. Some of you young preachers here tonight. Oh, 70 year old man got more excitement than you have. Get out of my way. I'd be ashamed of myself. I'm going to kill myself on that thing right there. Quit being satisfied. Go back home and do something for God. Well, we, we, we haven't grown any, but we, we, we sure have a good spirit. Well, spirits don't tithe. The Apostle Paul said, I'm satisfied with what I have, but I'm not satisfied with what I've done. Now, Paul knew what he was saying. Paul knew that if he did some more, he meant, it meant more struggle. If he did some more, it meant more battles. Paul knew that if he kept on going and did some more, it meant more, more times in jail and more beatings and more stonings and more heartache and more enemies and more lonely nights and more shipwrecks 
and more, more tears. Paul knew that, but Paul said, I'm not satisfied. Bring on the stonings. Bring on the enemy. Bring on the shipwreck. Bring on the heartache. Bring on the battles. I'm not satisfied. I want to do something big for God. In God's name, preachers, get out of here and go home and do something big for God. I'm so sick and tired of mediocrity. I don't know what to do. I'm tired of America talking about losing. I'm tired of you mothers telling your boys, be good losers, all shut up. Well, Johnny, you be a good loser. Hang losing. I, my boy's upstairs. I told him one day, we were watching a tennis match together. I told, and the guy that, that lost jumped over the net, put his arms around the guy that won, and they walked off the court arm in arm. And Dave said, Dad, I couldn't do that. I said, I don't want you to. He said, what should I do if I ever lose? I said, don't ever lose. But if you do, jump across the net, take your tennis racket, and clobber him with it. Years ago, I was watching a boxing match between Cuba and the United States. A little old stick in Cuba down there, about, about the size of Rhode Island, I guess. Just about that big on the map anyway. Little old Cuba down there beat the United States in boxing. I want to come out of retirement myself. I'm tired of losers. I'm tired of failures. And I'm tired of people saying, boy, he's a good guy. He's a good loser. Well, why don't you learn how to be a good winner? Paul said, I'm, I'm, I've not yet apprehended. I've not done all I want to do. I've not been all I want to place all I want to go. I've not won all the souls I want to win. I've not started all the churches I want to start. I've not preached all the sermons I want to preach. I've not had all the victories I want to have. I'm not yet after. I'm satisfied with my jail cell. I'm satisfied with my clothes and my food, but I am not satisfied with what I've done. He knew what it meant. He knew it meant more heartache, as I said a while ago. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no birth without travail. There is no victory without struggle. There is no, overcome, no one overcoming without obstacle. There is no medals won without battles. There are no crowns without crosses. There are no empty tombs without a sepulcher. There are no resurrections without a death. I recall years ago, Southern Baptists decided they could do just as well without me as they could with me. And I decided I could do better without them than I could with them. Several years ago, I was driving down Highway 67 outside Dallas. I didn't know it, but I looked up and there was a Dallas Baptist Association. They voted me out October 10, 1960, 19, sometime, 57. October 10th is the Day of Atonement. Seventh month, tenth day. Check your Bible. The Day of Atonement, they took two goats every year. Kill one, sprinkle his blood on him, and led the other out in the wilderness. October 10, 1957, the day of atonement, they took Joe Boyd and Jack Hiles. Kill one of us and put the other out in the wilderness. And I was driving by the Dallas Baptist Association about 5 o'clock in the morning. Got out of the car and wrote him a thank you note and put it in the door. You said, Brother House, I'm a Southern Baptist. The altar's full of people. You can use the altar tonight if you want to. You thought I'd forgotten what I was going to say, didn't you? I got voted out of the association. I was all the way down to the bottom. All the way down. I thought I couldn't preach anymore. I thought it was like the, the, the American Medical Association. You couldn't practice if you didn't belong. And to my office, phone rang. I picked it up and said hello. I thought that'd be a good thing to say. A voice said, Brother Jack, this is Brother Olaf. I said, Yes. He said, Brother Jack, you dead, ain't you? I said, Yes, I'm dead. He said, Brother Jack, ain't never been a resurrection without a death. I said, Glory to God, that qualifies me to get resurrected. I'm saying, There's no resurrection without death. There are no garlands without contest. There's no healing without illness. There's no movement without friction. There's no mountains without valleys. There's no deliverance without bondage. There's no perseverance without resistance. There's no comfort without sadness. There's no endurance without pain. 
There's no winning without an opponent. There's no conquering without an enemy. There's no capture without a fugitive. There's no comeback without a setback. There's no resolve without a challenge. There's no sunrise without a darkness. <laughs> there's no rising without a falling. There's no toil without sweat. There's no relief without discomfort. There's no consolation without bereavement. There's no victory without deprivation. There's no faith without doubt. There's no help without a need. There's no cheering without a depression. There's no burning bush without a wilderness. There's no vision of the third heaven without being stoned outside the city of Lystra. There's no parting of the waters of the Red Sea without facing a Red Sea. And there's no feeding of the fire fowls without hunger. I'm trying to tell you, quit your griping about where you live and what you wear and what you eat and get dissatisfied with what you've done. Now let me say this. Don't let handicaps steal your discontentment. Up at the house, I got a limp. So did Jacob. Well, I can't talk plain, neither could Moses. Moses was a Yankee. <coughs> I can prove it. Moses' sin was getting mad at Southerners. He said, Whoa, you rebels! You Yankees better be careful how you behave with us. <laughs> Don't let handicap. Look at Dan Parr standing up here at pastor school. 106 temperature. First time I told it, it was 101. It's gone up a degree every time I tell the story. This <laughs> time next year will be 114. Cancer. <laughs> Throat cancer. Doctor put him in the hospital, put him on oxygen. In Philadelphia, he said, I've got to preach at First Baptist Church Pastor School Monday night. The doctor said, you can't do it. And, and, and Dan Parr escaped the hospital, stole the oxygen tank. <laughs> Stood right here with the oxygen tank and oxygen going into his nose and preached and 57 men straight to preach the gospel. I'm saying don't let handicap keep you from being discontented. <clears throat> Look at Franklin Roosevelt, ruled the country from a wheelchair. Fanny Crosby, blind. Marlene Evans, cancer. Wendell Evans, an IQ of 13. Roy Moffat, ugly. <clears throat> Look at Charles Spurgeon, had to go down <clears throat> Mentone, France. His wife, an invalid, but he kept on going for God. Look at John Bunyan, 12 years in, 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 in prison, and <coughs> Bedford Prison. Look at David Brainerd at 29, died with consumption, praying his heart out for the Indians. I'm saying don't let, don't let, this, don't let handicap stop you discontent. David Livingston blazed the trail and carried the gospel as he explored Africa, and yet did it with disease and pain and heartache and burden and enemies and battles. I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, nobody's ever done anything for God who didn't say, I'm going to keep on going. <coughs> I've been looking forward to this part of the sermon. Don't let age steal your dis discontentment. <coughs> you know where old age starts? You say, 70. No, sir. I'm talking to people 30 years old that are older than I am. I'm talking to preachers 40 years old that are older than I am. <laughs> old age starts at contentment. <laughs> when you say, I'm satisfied with what I've done, I'm satisfied with what I am, you just got old. Some of you are old at 60. <coughs> Some are old at 50. Some are old at 40. Some are old at 30. Some of us are young at 70. We can't always kick straight, but we're... I'll try it again. God pity you little one microphone preachers. We got young men tonight, 40 years old, only kick off one microphone in a sermon. God have mercy on your soul. <coughs> oh, yes, I have the signs of old age. I have two hairs on top of my head. They're 14 feet long, woven carefully over the top of my head. My hair's like a stack of hay. I just put them all sides up toward the top. 
paralyze it with hairspray and leave it there till next year when I wash my hair. <laughs> Some of you folks laugh or go home tired looking at you. I got the signs of old age. I got eyesight. It's sort of bad. Doctor says I have a couple of years. I'll have to have uh, Cadillac surgery. Lincoln Town Car Cadillac surgery. He said, he said in a couple of years you have to have cataract surgery. Of course, that's three years ago when he said that. You didn't get that, did you? I know I've got all the signs of old age. I can't hear. Doctor said I've lost 35% of my hearing. At least that's what I think he said. I got a hernia. Had it four years. Plan to keep it. Ms. Hiles said, when are you going to have that hernia checked? I said, they call it an autopsy. <laughs> I've got a trust on right now. My favorite song is Trust and Obey. <laughs> but I'm not going to grow old. I'm not going to do it. I've never been as excited as I am right now. I've never enjoyed preaching like I enjoy it right now. I've never enjoyed serving God like I enjoy it right now. I'm trying to tell you, get up and do something for God. Get discontented with yourself. Ms. Hiles and I have decided not to grow old. <coughs> I tell our people, we still go to Lover's Lane. Yeah. We take a nap out there, but we go. <coughs> we still smooch and neck and pet and kiss. I don't mean like that. That's where you kiss your mother-in-law. It's like that. I'm not going to grow old. I'm not going to do it. You say, well, the highest you're 70. I'm younger than some of you young whippersnappers are. <laughs> Paul said, I'm in jail. I don't mind it. I can take it. I have jail clothes on. I'm, I'm contented. I'm eating jail food. I'm contented. But he said, I am not satisfied with what I've done. That's what happens to churches. <laughs> Last year, First Baptist Church Hammond, church 109 years old, I think. Pastor 70, going on 30. <clears throat> Everywhere I go, people say, who's going to take your place? I say, where am I going? <laughs> who's going to take my place? You think he's going to take my place? Can you imagine this church having him for a pastor? <laughs> How about him? He's the guy you ought to call. His hair is just like mine. <laughs> you think I'm going to have him for a pastor? He puts on a striped shirt. Just one stripe's all he has. I want you to know, old Dr. Ford Porter, getting up close to 80, I went down to preach for him. He took me out and showed me a big old piece of land they just bought. He said, my church is going to go here, and the college is going to go here, and the dining hall is going to go here, gymnasium is going to go here. Almost 80 years old, still planning. Now, not a single one of those... Boy, you talk about power. <laughs> that thing was screwed in all the way. Don't mess with me, Moffat. Oh, Moffat the prophet, don't mess with me. I'm, I, I'm so sick of <clears throat> the status quo. Anytime anybody gets a little excited, I'm going to do it for God, then all the critics start saying, it must be shallow. There's nobody as shallow as a bunch of folks that let the world go to hell. There's nobody as shallow as those that criticize the soul-winning, old-fashioned, hell-raising, bar-storming, winter rattling, single-pulling, hell-fire and damnation churches. Do something for God. Get out of here, preacher. Go home and do something for God. And you say, oh, just one Jack Hyde. Just one Jack Hyde. If I could holler as loud as he... 
Ken, I believe I could do something for God. Well, then holler. As I, funny as he is, he, he, these folks have been here for 37 and a half years. Everything I've said tonight, they've heard 45 times. They still laugh. Sort of a, <laughs> so What happens to churches? They get old. They get satisfied with what they've done. Pastors get 40 or 50 years old. Get satisfied. Get the new building and get satisfied. That's what the, what the prophet meant when he said, Woe unto those that are at ease in Zion. Notice didn't say at ease on the way to Zion because nobody gets at ease on the way to Zion. When you get in Zion, that's when you get at ease. Quit complaining about what you don't have and complain about what you haven't done. Quit complaining about your obtainments and lack of them. And start complaining about the lack of attainments. Quit complaining about your surroundings and start complaining about your, uh, the lack of your accomplishments. Quit complaining about your circumstances and start complaining about your lack of progress. Quit complaining about you, what you have and start complaining about what you have not done. The old man said, after 30 years since he got saved on the road to Damascus, Sits there in the Mamertine prison, rotting in jail. He said, uh, I've learned to be content with this. I'm content with what I have. I've learned in whatever state I am therewith to be content. But he said, I ain't through attaining yet. I count not myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do. Forgetting Thessalonica, Berea, Pamphylia, Perga, Lystra. Forgetting Colossae, Ephesus, Rome, Corinth. Forgetting all of that. He said, I have got some more Corinths. I've got some more Pergas. I've got some more Thessalonicas. I've got some more Antioch and Pisidias. I've got some more Pamphylias. I've got some more Cypresses. I've got some more victories to win. Let me ask you a question. Are you satisfied with your Sunday school class? Are you satisfied with your bus route? I'd like to cause you to be discontented with your bus route, discontented with your church. Discont I don't mean unhappy with your church. I mean discontented with what you've done for God. Paul said, I, I'm not pleased or satisfied with what I've done. i got three here still standing. Four. <laughs> Some of you husbands don't like that, do you? Now, you listen to me. Pastor school is not just so you can come and hoop and holler. Pastor school so you can come and get yourself charged up to go home and do something for God. And the First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana is not here just so folks can come and sing the Gloria Patria and the sevenfold Ramen on Sunday. We're here because there's an area here lost and on its way to hell. We baptized 11,000 people last year, and over, bless God, we're going to baptize more than 11,000 people this year. I'm pressing on the upward way. New Heights, I'm, boy, this looks like a war zone up here. Like a bunch of 4Fs over here on this side. I want to... I want you to get dissatisfied with what you've done. I want you to quit griping about where you live. I want you to quit griping about what you wear, what you eat. I recall years ago, the Calvary Baptist Church of New York City contacted me. That's when William Air had left there. I wonder if I was interested in considering that church. I had a little church down in Texas running a handful of people. I said, no, I don't want it. And our church was running about 700 a year. The Metropolitan Tabernacle in Atlanta, Georgia, where Lynn G. Broughton used to pastor, contacted me. When I was a young man, I was a pretty hot number. Ain't nobody contacts me anymore. <laughs> I recall <clears throat> one time Moody Church sent a representative over to ask if I'd be interested. I said, yeah, if the whole board resigns. High Street 
<coughs> Baptist Church in Springfield. It was a great church running 3,000 Sunday school contacted me years ago. I wasn't looking for a big church. I'd rather have an opportunity to build one. I want to do something for God. I want to do more for God than I've ever done. Check what last year. <coughs> last year alone, we bought four houses over here. Built a parking lot over here. We got a half million dollars invested right over there since you were here last year. <coughs> we bought this parking lot over here. It's called a minus parking lot. We're going to change it to the plus parking lot. <laughs> Shut up. <coughs> we bought that Jewish synagogue out there. Eight hundred thousand dollars. Paid cash for it. That's last year. We baptized more than we have baptized. Well, how's, what you going to do next year? Moment did last. What you going to do next year? We're going to buy the Christian Science Reading Room. <laughs> Jehovah Witnesses Hall. What do you call it? Kingdom Hall. I may buy Notre Dame. I'm not told. Capuchin Seminary yesterday, Notre Dame tomorrow, and sooner or later, the Vatican City. Boy, I'd like to reach out tonight and shake you to discontentment. I'd like to grab you Sunday school teachers and get you discontented because you've been running the same ever since Noah and the Ark. I'd like to get you bus captains that are satisfied with what you've been doing, get you all stirred up, be some dissatisfied with what you've done. I'd like to grab you preachers with a nap of the neck and shake you good and hard and say, in God's name, get dissatisfied. Well, Brother Hines, my parsonage is just not very much. It's better than a Mamertine prison. It's better than a Bedford jail. Paul said, I am contented with what I have, but I am not contented with what I have done. Now, we, I've cut up a lot. I've been devastating a lot. It does a old man good to do this, to find something you kick over. I try to kick over people, but they get back up. <laughs> Microphones obey me. But I'd like to. I'd like to get some of you young whippersnappers to quit being so dissatisfied with where you live and what you wear, what kind of car you drive. I'd like to get you dissatisfied with what you've done. We ought to at pastor school this year. We ought, to, we ought to build a hundred churches, start a hundred churches, and double a hundred others. Paul said, I have nothing to complain about concerning my circumstances. This prison's all right. Prison food's okay. Prison clothes are okay. But he said, I'm not satisfied with what I've done. His mind goes back to Lystra. His mind goes back to Derby and Iconium and Pamphylia. His mind goes back to Cyprus. His mind goes back to Thessalonica and Ephesus and Colossae. And Rome and Corinth, and his mind goes back, and he says, I, I've done a lot, but I'm not satisfied. How about you? How about you? Are you satisfied with your Sunday school class? Your bus route? Are you wives satisfied with the kind of wife you've been? Are you husbands satisfied with the kind of husband you've been? Shoot. I mean, Amen. I told I tell this around the country, but I have told it here. Somebody said, we, we were in Hawaii. Three people asked us we were on a honeymoon. Three people. They're both 98 years old, but they asked us that. The pilot of the airplane came back and said, are you on a honeymoon? I'm 70. She's 39 or so. Somebody said, Brother Howe, an old man like you? Yeah. Just because there's snow on the roof don't mean there's no fire in the furnace, bless God. So you folks laugh or go home. I'm sick of looking at you. I got three ladies here. I'm going to preach till they smile. You call that a preachathon. One thing different, me and you preachers, that is I have fun when I preach. And I'm not scared. My deacon chairman's sitting right here. Right there. That's my deacon chairman. Yeah, you think I'm scared of him? Sure. 
I got deacons in the choir. I got deaconesses. I got women here that are deacons. And the Pope's a Presbyterian, too. But I'd like to challenge you tonight. Whatever you're doing for God, get out of here and be dissatisfied with it. Paul said, I have no complaints about my circumstances, but I am not satisfied with what I've done. Our Heavenly Father, I'm going to quit. I don't want to quit. These folks knew how long I wanted to preach that faint. But I'm going to quit. But I pray in the name of Christ you'd shake some people here tonight. People that more, complain more about what they don't have than what they've not done. People complain more about their circumstances than their attainments and accomplishments. Do something big tonight. 